screen. Here we go. All right, so welcome to the November Interreach webinar. Um, my name is Christine Glover. I am the uh, webinar chair. And I just wanted to um, remind you all that we're recording this video and um, this webinar, and it's going to be posted to the Interreach webinar archives along with all of our other videos. You can find those at interreach.org if you have interest in going back to. Um, looking to look at our archives so um, and if you have any suggestions for future webinars I'm happy to entertain any ideas so please um, feel free to send me an email it's Christine with a K dot Glauber that's G-L-A-U-B-E-R at duke.edu um, and I'm happy to suggest or uh, take any suggestions for um, future webinars so uh, Today's, today's host is Dr. Carrie Capel, and she is a marine conservation biologist and professional facilitator with 15 years of experience in the interdisciplinary and intersectoral collaboration. Gonna make sure that everybody is muted. There we go. Okay, great. Can you all still hear me? Then just mute myself, right? <laughs> no, I'm good. Okay. Um, so Carrie is a senior fellow at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Th Synthesis. As a facilitator, Carrie has helped numerous groups to build collaborative cultures and processes that foster creativity, strategic thinking, and productivity. In her research, she collaborates across disciplines and sectors to enhance understanding and co-create solutions to coastal management challenges. So I had um, first come across Carrie's work in the um, I2S Insights blog um, by Gabrielle Bammer, and so she had uh, posted a, a blog in May about the grown zone and how to work through that um, as a facilitator and how to help, uh, help the groups that you're facilitating uh, work through that. And um, I just found some of the tools that she suggested to be very helpful as I was uh, starting to uh, get to know the facilitation uh, profession. So uh, so we reached out to Carrie and um, in, through our discussions, we came across this um, interesting topic where uh, we're starting to see facilitation as a, a thing that uh, academic institutions are starting to actually put dollars to. So, um, so we thought this would be a great opportunity for um, for us to dig in and see what the state of the of the field is, and and try to understand what um, what the career paths are for um, facilitation within academic institutions. So, with that, I will hand it over to Carrie, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, it's really a delight to be here and to uh, get a chance to talk with all of you. I was so um, thrilled to learn about Interreach uh, every time I have that experience of realizing, oh, there are more people out there like me who believe in and put their energy towards making collaboration work. Um, the um, the better I feel about the world, and uh, and I think we all benefit from being in community and communities of practice and being um, uh, and learning together. So I appreciate the chance to join you and to share a little bit of my um, journey through um, the academic world and into the um, facilitation space. Um, I. Christine already said this, um, but I will just underline that I'm going to start with the assumption that team science facilitation is a thing. <laughs> um, it's not been um, a thing for very long, I would say. It's a, um, there have been people playing this role in uh, research collaborations for many years, but often without a formal hat on. Uh, and increasingly, I think, institutions and funders and um, investigators are recognizing the importance of process and good process design and facilitation and they're they're beginning to value the benefits of um, having someone explicitly play that role whether they are inside the team or they come in from outside the team to support the effort so um, 
we're going to start with that assumption that that this is a thing, uh, a growing thing, and a valuable thing. Um, and where I want to um, take you today is um, uh, this is where we're headed. So I'm going to um, lay out just a little bit of my own history and my um, my journey. I in preparation for this, I've been reaching out to other colleagues who work in this space and. Um, asking them for their stories and comparing notes on how we ended up doing this kind of strange thing. And, um, and there are some common themes, I think, and just the sharing of the stories um, for me was really rich and interesting. So hopefully um, you'll uh, humor me as I uh, share a little bit of personal history about how I got to this point. And then um, I'll describe what my current practice looks like in terms of supporting teams through uh, facilitation. And, um, and then broaden out more generally to the different business models that are out there for um, team science facilitation and where those live and who tends to populate them. Um, I'll talk about training and career opportunities for folks who may be interested in this role. And, um, and then come back to this initial value proposition and talk a little bit about what's made possible by um, investing in facilitation um, skills and capacities within your team science enterprise. Uh, and then I really look forward to opening it up to this group for a discussion. So um, we'll spend about um, 30 minutes or so on presentation and then really shift to, to interaction and questions. Um, and so I, I encourage you to, um, Put questions in the chat. Um, I've got it open so I can um, see. So if there's something that's not clear as we're, as we're going on or you want me to pause and you want to ask a question, um, feel free to do that via the chat. And, um, and then uh, if you um, just want to hold your questions, that's also fine and we'll open it up for conversation after the presentation. So unless there are any questions right now, um, which if you have them, you can stick them in the chat. I will, um, I'll just dive in. So, um, I got into science because I was a, an outdoorsy kid. Um, I spent a lot of time roaming the woods of West Virginia where I grew up and um, relishing the time that I got on family vacations to um, comb the beaches of the eastern shore of Virginia for um, treasures, seashells, and tiny creatures. Um, and I think I always had a fondness for the little overlooked things, um, but I also always had an interest in the linkages among things. I feel like I was a born ecologist. Um, and that love of science was um, supported and cultivated by my parents. And um, by early experiences as a junior high student, um, when I was in seventh grade, I got the opportunity to go to the Shoals Marine Lab in the Gulf of Maine, which was quite a long way away from the hills of West Virginia. And uh, I felt like this guy coming off the dock, like, yes, I have come to this amazing place. Um, I still have the notes that I took from the, the lectures that were given by Cornell professors there about marine mammals and um, phytoplankton and the whole um, uh, Gulf of Maine ecosystem. I was just lit up. And so that set me on this path uh, to studying science. It sent me um, to eventually to Brown University where I did my undergraduate degree in biology and um, worked in a number of labs, uh, including the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And it, um, it really just ignited my, my passion for science um, and my desire for that, that basic curiosity about the natural world to also be useful to the world, to be of service. Um, my um, grad school experience uh, took me to Stanford um, after actually having spent a number of years um, in the environmental education world. I, um, I went on to, to the Hopkins Marine Station and got to dive into this um, really wonderful project that was funded by the NSF Biocomplexity Program on um, the science of marine protected areas. And it was, I had this uh, desire to, to tackle some big hairy problem, but as a PhD student, of course, you have to constrain 
your topic to something manageable, but this was it's kind of the perfect scenario for me because I got to do my piece embedded in this big interdisciplinary collaborative project that brought together um, social scientists and anthropologists, um, uh, economists, mathematicians, GIS folks, um, geneticists, oceanographers, ecologists, uh, and um, it was my first experience of navigating the complexity of that kind of interdisciplinary collaboration. The personalities, the um, intellectual turf wars, uh, and the, the um, insights and delights and um, novel uh, surprises that came from combining knowledge across disciplines. So that really um, whet my appetite for uh, more of that kind of work. Um, the picture here is just one product that came out of that um, project. This is a, um, a popular guide to uh, marine protected area design that that was a, that summarized the results of that several effort to synthesize and, and analyze a large amount of different types of data about um, how marine protected areas should be designed to function well in the Bahamas. From there, I was lucky enough to land at NCES. Um, NCES is the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. It was originally an NSF-funded synthesis center, um, part of UC Santa Barbara, and started in 1995, I believe. We had um, 15, 16 years of NSF funding and then um, fledged into a more diversified um, funding model. But the core um, operating model of NCS has, has always been the same. We are engaged in the pursuit of um, transformative environmental science. We use um, collaborative working groups as the main mode of our work. And we believe deeply in collaboration and also in open science data practices. And um, the center has a real strength in, um, in, the, in data science as well. So I, um, I was thrilled to land at NCS and um, in particular to be able to continue to be working in a collaborative space. Um, collaboration is just in the DNA of NCS. The, the working group model involves groups of scientists from um, different institutions proposing a project that they can um, tackle using existing data and synthesis methods. And they're funded to come here for uh, four or five meetings over the course of two years, typically. And each of those meetings is a four or five day, sometimes shorter, um, immersion in the, the project and the um, data sets. And they're really intended to be working meetings. Um, so that's a great milieu to land in as a young scientist because there are amazing scientists coming here all the time from all over the world and they're working on a really wide array of different, um, uh, different topics. Uh, I, after my postdoc, transitioned into a soft money research track here at NCS, um, but throughout all my work was, has been collaborative and, and most of it pretty interdisciplinary. Uh, and I've had the chance over the years to be the member, a member of many different working group teams, either as a participant or a leader or an advisor because of my um, position here as a senior fellow at NCS. Um, so uh, these actually are um, some of our recent data fellows. Um, they also have participated in various working groups. What I started, and this is a, this is a beautiful art and science um, mural that's in the lounge at NCS. Um, what I started noticing was um, that the success or failure of these working groups was a nuanced thing. Um, I started really noticing the importance of leadership particularly prepared leadership, um, the importance of a clear and shared vision among all working group participants, which is really no small thing, um, the importance of the individuals in the group, their relationships with one another and how they chose to show up to the work, to an individual meeting, to the series of meetings, to the work that has to happen in between the meetings. Um, and underlining all of that really was um, 
the importance of trust and strong relationships. Uh, our previous, the director when I first came to NCS uh, used to joke that NCS is the National Center for Eating and Socializing. Um, so we definitely know the power of social cohesion and there were a lot of things that NCS was doing to create a space where people would feel um, supported to collaborate and comfortable and would have opportunities to bond with one another. Um, and yet still I was starting to see um, some groups succeed and some groups fail for reasons that seem to have nothing to do with the intellectual heft of the people that were in the room, the strength of that, their ideas, or the quality of the data they were analyzing. Some of those groups just weren't able to unlock the potential for mutual benefit for a collaboration that would, um, that would yield greater than the sum of the parts results. And that, that got me wondering why. Um, and so I started talking about that. <laughs> opening my mouth about it and um, and seeking out um, resources to help me better understand what supports collaboration effectively and what we can do, particularly in the meeting, to um, strengthen the dynamics and the outcomes. So I started having conversations with folks here at NCS about that, including our um, director at the time, Frank Davis. And about that same time, um, the SNAP program was starting up, which stands for um, Science for Nature and People Partnership. SNAP is a partnership between NCS and the Nature Conservancy and the Wildlife Conservation Society. And it's really focused on asking, using this working group model to ask questions at the intersection of nature conservation, human well-being, and development. Um, a well thought out and feasible pathway to implementation uh, by which the scientific re results would be applied to policy or practice. And the groups included both researchers and practitioners, they, they, they include them today, uh, and increasingly um, we, what we were seeing was that these groups, um, unlike the original NCS working groups that tended to be mostly academics, these um, these groups were um, a mix of academics and, and um, folks from other sectors, and they were also um, quite interdisciplinary. And so uh, in this context, we need for um, facilitation support for some of these teams so that they would um, set off in a, um, with a, a good process design and good support. So um, Frank, when he learned of my interest, encouraged me and uh, made some investments in my professional development. Um, so with NC support, I did a number of different trainings to come on the school parks training, a couple of different trainings um, in uh, graphic recording and graphic facilitation. I have um, a long abiding interest in art and um, and that was feeling undernourished at this point in my in my professional life and um, uh, something just sparked me to take one of these workshops and it was such to me these materials and the audio shoot. Yeah, it looks like we're having some issues with the connection. Yeah, I'm seeing that in the chat. Is it is it better now? I did get a, a momentary message that the that my internet was unstable, but it looks okay now, but Okay. Well, let's try it again. Okay. Do you want me to, to um, go back or are we? It started happening for me around um, your slide on SNAP. Okay. So I don't know if it's, if that works for everybody else. Um. Yeah, that's a good idea, Brad. 
switching to a phone connection. Potentially. I also just, I just turned off my video. Okay. For now. Um, I can also, I can switch to the phone. Let's see. Um, while I, well, let's see if, if just turning off the video does it. If not, if you have issues again, please just jump into the chat and then I'll, um, I'll switch to a phone audio, but it looks great. like we're right now. Yeah, it sounds okay right now. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for your patience. So as I was saying around this time that I started really getting interested in, um, working group process and facilitation, the SNAP program was starting up, which is the Science for Nature and People Partnership. And this um, is a collaborative funding initiative that supports working groups that look at the intersection of nature conservation, human well-being, and development. Um, uh, and the SNAP program really um, focuses both on science outcomes, but also um, implementation. So the, you, to be successful, you really have to have a well thought out, feasible pathway to implementation. You have to have members of your group who are going to help you help get the science applied to policy or practice. So these groups include both researchers and practitioner, practitioners, and they're significantly interdisciplinary and intersectoral, and, and more so than previous NCs working groups had been. So it was in that context that um, Frank Davis and I started talking about um, the need for facilitation for these groups and knowing my interest, Frank encouraged me and invested in some professional development for me. So I did a number of trainings to complement my, um, my on-the-job training from participating in working groups over the years. Uh, and I'm happy to share the specifics of those um, actually later in the presentation. Uh, one of the things that just sparked my um, creativity early on was some training in graphic recording and graphic facilitation. I had sort of a latent interest in art that I hadn't been feeding. And when I learned there was this way of um, drawing to help support conversations, I got really excited about it. And so that's been something I have woven into my work um, over the last couple of years. Uh, this is a, a picture from an amazing training that I did with Kelvy Bird, who's associated with MIT and Otto Scharmer's um, Theory U uh, and the Presencing Institute. And she's an incredible graphic um, practitioner scribe and she teaches uh, teaches these methods. So I started facilitating SNAP groups on the side. And that was about 10 or 20 percent of the time, um, while at the same time I was facilitating and uh, leading uh, and conducting research in a, a large interdisciplinary collaborative multi-institution project called the Ocean Tipping Points Project, which consumed most of my attention for about five years. Um, but my own tipping point <laughs> during that time was um, a kind of growing dissatisfaction um, and grief. Uh, in particular, I was feeling like my life was spent all up in my head and not in my body. I was disconnected from the ecological world that that drove me to do this work in the first place and that I was working so hard to protect, spending all my time sitting at the computer. Um, and I was also pretty frustrated with the limits of the academic system and kind of maddened by some of the ego dynamics. Um, and I had been pushing my work closer and closer to the end users of the science, but still feeling the limits of working um, within the academic system and wanting more impact, wanting more transformative change. Um, and so, uh, this is not me, it's just a stock image, but uh, a year, couple years ago, I decided to really make the leap and flip that script from doing, you know, 80 to 90% research and 10 or 20% facilitation to the other way around. And um, part of that was really a, a, a personal desire to reclaim um, 
the art making that I love and to um, and to be able to be more broadly of service to really transformative research. So um, I, uh, the, it was a good timing. I wound down um, my research projects. They were at their natural end. And then I had to work really hard to say no, no to grant writing. And, and I started saying yes to more facilitation and more consulting and leaning into business development um, I had a couple of great opportunities to get in front of local nonprofit leaders and also some um, big environment, international environmental NGO leaders as um, a facilitator, and that led to work. Uh, and I've also been really lucky to find some local partners who are um, also in the also facilitators with complementary skills, and um, collaborating with them has been a real a real joy and a rich learning experience for me. So um, that is me uh, thinking about business development in one of these workshops uh, and um, expressing my desire to move from this unique set of skills that I have um, and constantly be learning. Uh, and that's what I'm really feeling in the facilitation work now because each group is new, each um, challenge is new. I have to rapidly get up to speed and uh, it's just fun to, to dive into a new topic. Um, I currently straddle university and consulting worlds and I don't know how common this is. Um, most people, to colleagues I talked to had um, kind of made the leap uh, and we're doing one or the other with, with some exceptions. But for me, um, having a courtesy appointment at the university so that I can stay on at NCs um, gives me all the benefits of the university in terms of um, the rich environment for interaction and access to university resources. And I um, still work with NCs and facilitate several SNAP working groups a year, but now I'm doing it as a contractor. And um, I do a fair bit of consulting with um, other universities, nonprofits, and government agencies. At, um, at different scales, locally in our county, throughout California, even um, some global or uh, international engagements. The services that I offer are meeting design and facilitation, uh, graphic facilitation. This is an example from a recent meeting I just did a, a week ago here in Santa Barbara around climate resilience to wildfire and smoke. Um, I'll do graphic recording like this, um, but I also use graphic facilitation as a tool, um, interactive tool with participants. Sometimes that means creating templates for them to draw on and write on. Um, sometimes it means using diagrams or um, visual models at the front to um, try to make sense of complex concepts. I also find that I'm doing a fair bit of strategic um, work with groups, so uh, whether that's strategic planning, uh, research agenda design, um, or um, visioning, like futures thinking work to, um, to determine new opportunities for um, collaborative teams. Um, so I've been operating as an independent contractor. Um, I'm shifting to operating via an LLC this year. Um, but I, you know, in either configuration, I'm pretty much just a woman and her cat. <laughs> and, um, and then I have a lot of people that I partner with. And so far that has worked well for me, but I recognize that there are a variety of different business models for facilitation. Um, as I said, I've been talking to others in the field um, in advance of this to, to try to articulate what those um, different models are. And um, I think um, I've found team science facilitators doing this work both inside the university and without. Um, I've found them working on their own as staff or consultants or as parts of institutions that support collaboration in one way or another. Um, so within the university, there are sometimes university staff who provide facilitation services to their department or across multiple departments. Usually they wear multiple hats. I haven't yet encountered folks who get to do full-time facilitation within the university. 
um, unless they're doing some consulting outside of the university as well. Uh, there are also um, university centers and institutes that provide facilitation um, serving internal groups within their university, but also sometimes external clients. Uh, the Duke um, Team Science Corps is a good example of that. Uh, they're um, promoting team science skills and concepts at the university and the health system, including offering facilitation and meeting support. Um, as another example here is Western, um, or sorry, Washington State University's in Vancouver's um, Initiative for Public Deliberation. Um, so they uh, do both training for, um, for students in facilitation and then they place those student facilitators it, it with um, projects and public um, decision making and deliberation spaces. So they work with local institutions, government schools and community organizations and they do a cool mix of training, research and facilitation. In terms of training opportunities, um, I, uh, as I said, this is a relatively, um, team science facilitation, I would say, is a, a relatively new thing to most academics. And so there aren't, there are a few formal programs in this within the university, but there are op plenty of opportunities to learn. And the places where I would go to look for that kind of training within a university setting include action research programs. And um, the ULAB program at MIT is a, um, an online resource that I really recommend. They're a massive open online course uh, led by Otto Scharmer, who's a lecturer at MIT. And um, they're all about systems change. Uh, and while it's not specifically a facilitation training, I think there's a, there's a ton to be learned from them about um, how people come together um, to connect and um, allow uh, innovations and new ideas to emerge from the collaboration. Participatory research programs are also a good place to, to build skills. I know that this webinar series has had some folks from that space uh, recently talk about their work and a lot of that really resonated with me. It's very aligned. Um, design thinking programs like the one at Stanford um, end up building a lot of skill, facil facilitation skills in folks who take their courses and go through their programs, as do um, organizational development courses and programs at um, many business schools. Uh, and then, um, like WSU and some other places, this, these centers on campus that are focused on public deliberation or conflict resolution can also be training hubs for, um, for students. A good example of that is Colorado State University's Center for Public Deliberation. Um, I have a colleague who was a student facilitator with them and now has gone on to launch her own independent um, facilitation business. I think there's, there are a number of alumni from this program who are now working in this space with um, team science collaborations. Um, extension offices can also be a good place to look for trainings. UC Davis offers courses, for example, um, in conflict resolution through their collaboration center. And then um, outside the university, there are lots of um, trainings that are available, many, many, many. Um, these are just a handful of them, um, which are ones that I've found benefit from. Uh, Grove Consulting and Kelvy Bird both do um, visual graphic uh, scribing uh, trainings, which are excellent, which I've taken. I really appreciate the liberating structures. Um, uh, package they actually are an open source facilitation platform so they have a website where all of their microstructures and principles for facilitation are shared openly and I encourage you to go check them out celebratingstructures.com um, Sam Kaner's uh, book facilitators guide to participatory decision-making I've found to just be a kind of a Bible for this stuff and many of these other groups draw on his learnings um, and the art of hosting is one that is often um, the basis for um, the principles and practices of facilitation that you'll find a lot of professionals are using today. 
So quickly, just some core competencies that I think are worth cultivating if you're gonna play the role of a facilitator. Um, one's the ability to practice and model generous listening. So by this, I mean really coming from a place of empathy and working to really hear what the other person is saying, knowing that we all process and filter and hear things based on our own biases. So being able to do this and to train a group in how to do it is really critical. Um, I think for working with groups of scientists, some level of technical capacity is really helpful um, and particularly having an understanding of the scientific process and um, some of the touchstones of research culture. Uh, I've found that a big part of helping people to look, figure out how to work together is aligning incentives. So you have to really understand what motivates them as a human and um, what sort of incentive structure they're working within in their work and, um, and figure out ways that they can be rewarded within the collaboration so you can harness that, um, that direction and get everybody pulling, um, pulling the same way. That takes good interpersonal skills and awareness. Um, it also takes thoughtful process design to figure out how you're going to um, provide the scaffolding so that people build trust with each other, build trust in the process, um, and get clear early on about what they're doing together and how they're gonna do it. There are a lot of um, principles, frameworks, and tools out there. And in some sense, it doesn't matter a whole lot which ones you use, but you need to have some <laughs> basic principles and a framework that you're working from. Um, and a, and a, you know, a diversity of tools in your toolbox so you can be responsive to the situation and the needs of the group. Um, and then I found it really helpful, uh, at least personally, to be someone who's able to attend to the details and the specifics. Science is so specific, um, but also able to step back and see the big picture and then able to synthesize that complex information in a way that helps support the group's understanding and helps move them forward. There are um, a number of interesting influences on modern facilitation that kind of got us to where we are. I feel like any endeavor is a product of the moment that you're living in. Um, so while a lot of the history of um, facilitation may have been grounded in business and organizational thinking about organizational development and learning, um, somewhat informed by systems thinking that's kind of coming in both from the business side and the academic side. Um, and um, conflict resolution and mediation skills. Increasingly, I'm seeing also a kind of novel set of influence or a more recent set of influences that are affecting how people think about convening and holding space and creating a container for collaboration. And those include um, an understanding of participatory decision making and involving the, the stakeholders in any work in the actual co-creation. So that could be for public policy decision making or it could be for research. Um, there's a strong influence from social movements and social change making that I'm feeling come into the facilitation space in really um, generative and beneficial ways. Um, there's also a lot that's being informed by the study of um, our social relationships and, um, and the ways that we can enhance our communication with one another. Um, Consciousness and mindfulness practices, I think, are also affecting the practice of facilitation. They're a big part of what helped me make this shift and what I try to, to bring in, in gentle ways to uh, groups of scientists. Um, and then finally, the, I think the, the larger um, global conversation that's happening around diversity, equity, justice, um, diversity, inclusion, justice, and equity is, um, is certainly uh, affecting the um, the way that we hold space now. I see that my um, my next slide got <laughs> got the words got a little um, messed up in the conversion, um, but maybe this just indicates that these are these are blurry boundaries. Uh, I just wanted to um, to share this one framework that is always with me when I'm facilitating, which is that. We're, our work as a facilitator is to really try to create a container 
for um, deeper change to be made possible. And that starts with yourself, with creating um, a, a safe space to show up as your whole self, with bringing deep self-awareness of your biases, of your listening frame, of the lenses of your, the way that your past experience influences how you show up in the world and modeling that to a group. Um, and then moving from there out to the collaborative and, um, and seeking ways to deepen the awareness and consciousness of that group and help them um, come together to create something that's greater than the sum of the parts. Doing that tends to have um, beautiful ripple effects back into their rest of their worlds. So the experience of effective collaboration turns people into collaborators. <laughs> We've seen this over and over again at NCs. Um, and then that affects their organizations and the communities that they go back in to. Um, and ultimately it, um, it affects our world. So I, I really try to think about um, facilitation as a practice of not just thinking about how to do team science more effectively, but how to do team science in a way that creates a container for transformation that leads to real transformative outcomes to address the challenges of our time. Because to me, that's, that is one of the highest uh, and best uses of science. Um, so that container has to be held in a way because of the scaling from self to collaborative to community to the global um, that can allow for individual growth and transformation, but also up, open up new possibilities for the practice of science, for new fields to emerge, for new forms of inquiry, for new ways to create and integrate knowledge. Um, there are many benefits to facilitation. I'll just um, offer a few. I don't think I'll belabor these. I would much rather um, have some time to hear from you all what you've seen as the benefits. Um, but I will note here that that um, fundamental piece of building human connection is at the heart of it for me. There are all kinds of barriers to team science facilitation, particularly money, <laughs> um, where our funding models aren't often set up for this. And, um, and the fact that people, um, PIs and project leads may not yet know that they need a facilitator, or they may not um, value the process, uh, they may not have put money in the budget in the first place to invest in facilitation. So that's a feedback loop that we can try to interrupt. Um, and I've found that working with clients over time, they have come to realize the value of facilitation and they've just built it into their funding models. So that's one of the ways to open the door. Um, building it into grants and collaborative endeavors. Um, facilitation, for example, is just built into the SNAP working group funding model. Um, giving more people a chance to, to experience this, um, providing training and talking about what we're doing, like I'm doing today, and, um, and building a community of practice, as you all have been doing. I think all of these can help contribute to creating, building a stronger foundation for this and a, um, and a real field around it. So, um, with that, I would love to, um, to hear your thoughts. Uh, maybe we'll start just with questions um, or reflections uh, and whether, in particular, if there was something that sparked your curiosity um, or resonated with you in the presentation, I would love to hear them. And then I, I would also, we'll, I have some more questions later, but would love to um, encourage you to share resources that you know of that can um, provide training or support for, for facilitation. I see there's one in the chat window already. So I will, um, Christine, maybe turn it to you to um, mediate how folks um, share their questions. You can share them audi audibly or in the chat window. And I'll turn my video back on. We'll see how that works. Yeah, thank you so much, Carrie. This was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I really appreciated the all of the resources that you shared, um, getting um, 
kind of firsthand accounts of other facilitators experiences within um, other institutions, the core competencies. Um, yeah, just some really, really great stuff here. Um, so I think, yeah, if anyone has questions or anything that resonated with them and they want to um, uh, jump in with questions, um, you can do that, at, like, like Carrie said, in the chat box or just um, unmute yourself. Um, and I see that Cheryl has a question about uh, whether the slide deck will be available. Um, we are recording this right now, so the video of the webinar will be available on interreach.org. So you can go ahead and find it there, and I will uh, leave it up to Carrie if she would like to share her slides as well. Yeah, I'm happy to do so, and um, and I would uh, also be happy to to um, compile a list of um, training resources uh, and add to it things that are submitted via the chat, and then we can figure out how to post that. Great. So Grace had a question. Can you suggest ways to articulate the impact uh, or potential impact when making the case for the need for facilitation? Yeah, so um, the I think the biggest selling point for um, Project PIs, um, lead investigators, is that it is such a relief. Um, and I know this firsthand from having been a project lead uh, and then stepped into the role of outside facilitator. Um, it's such a relief to have an ally in the um, in holding space in the room and and be able to offload that piece to um, an external professional uh, and then dive in um, yourself into the content and really um, uh, inhabit the role of the chair or the intellectual lead of the project. Um, it's it's very difficult to do both. I do I do know people who do it really effectively, um, but it's it's taxing, <laughs> and it's hard to navigate um, staying really unbiased and impartial when you are also a participant in the research and you, particularly as a you know as a a leader in the project have a stake in the game. Um, so I think that's one piece for the, in a kind of on a personal level for the, um, for the lead, it's just a relief to them to know that someone else is gonna be holding that. I think the other piece is that um, well-facilitated meetings are um, incredibly um, effective in deliver and, and productive in delivering outcomes. And so um, the, to funders, it can be, um, I think it's a, it's a strong case can be made that um, with a facilitator, you're more likely to um, deliver concrete outcomes in um, a time effective way. Um, I think a lot of groups spin their wheels and spend a, spend a lot of time um, retreading old territory because they, um, they don't have a well-designed process and they don't have someone who's really tracking the clear next steps and roles and responsibilities and, and um, keeping the group accountable to those. And that's one thing that a um, facilitator can really do. Um, let's see, then there's... Um, Question about challenges faced um, by facilitators of team science in university settings and how you suggest overcoming these challenges. Um, I think, I mean, it really depends on um, the degree to which you are embedded in a team that already, um, or a university that already values facilitation. Um, if if you're in that lucky setting, then I think the challenges come down to um, really getting people's attention, making sure that you have, that people invest the time in pre-planning and 
getting the right people involved in the in the process design. A facilitator can can um, go a long way towards designing an agenda for a group, but but that's only as good as the input that they get from the research team about what they're trying to accomplish. So um, the biggest challenge that I've often faced um, doing this within a university setting is just that people are so busy and they tend to undervalue process and they don't put a lot of time into planning. They've been rewarded for winging it and being okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so that yeah, helping people invest in the planning piece, I think is, it's a big challenge, um, but uh, as I've grown in confidence about the results that I can deliver, I've just gotten more um, direct with people about how much time is required. I mean, my rule of thumb is is at least one to one, if not two to one, um, the number of days of planning that go into the um, in the meeting. So, just being clear with people about that, I think, helps. Um, there's a question about whether the impact of professional facilitation has been empirically evaluated in team science. I, um, I did a little bit of digging into the, um, into the formal literature around this, and there are um, a, a small number of papers looking at the impact of facilitation. Um, we've actually been uh, starting to do a little evaluation of that at NCS on the SNAP working groups, but we're still too small of numbers to have um, concrete results from that. Um, it, I'd say it's a pretty understudied area, but there are um, folks in a variety of fields. Um, I don't think anyone has looked across team science as a whole, but um, within um, uh, translational medical research, for example, I saw some papers around the value of, of facilitation. Um, I think that's something that might be worth uh, reviewing more in a more um, systematic way than I did. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Christine about where where would you suggest someone whose facilitation role is limited to working with teams competing for grants um, focus their energies in terms of learning or skill building? knowing that you've got lots of other hats you have to wear and lots of other um, work to do um, and non-meeting work. Yeah, I, um, I think um, I, I, I really heartily recommend Sam Kaner's book, uh, The Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making. There's a lot of good frameworks in there that would serve you not just within meetings, but also in project management. Um, and they're pre presented very clearly and um, and simply. Um, so I think that's a good one. There are, um, I really found the liberating structures training to be very helpful in my, um, in my research world. Their, their main premise is that um, as humans, we have, you know, professional humans, we have you know, a small number, three to five ways that we typically um, structure our meetings together. There's, you know, the boardroom, there's the, you know, someone stands at a lectern and gives a presentation, there's brainstorming. Um, but actually there, there are many, many, many more different microstructures that we could use to interact, to, to facilitate and structure how we interact with each other. Um, and they draw on a lot of different sources from teaching and from um, business and and from other um, facilitators and I and their and their work is really grounded in systems thinking um, and as I said it's open source so if you I would check out liberatingstructures.com just to get ideas about the kinds of little mini things you could do differently in your day to day um, work that might be helpful. Um, those are some kind of um, ways to build your toolbox. In terms of learning, um, yeah, I'm not, I, I think it's, a, it's kind of a matter of your own, what sparks your own personal interest, but um, any, 
think in general, work that you can do on personal growth and self-development um, to better understand your, your own motivations and your, your core um, will serve you in working in a supporting role with a team. Um, Julie says, I'm a practitioner architect who does design and research on high performance buildings and occupant behavior in Washington State. I have a part time position with University of Washington as well. Do you have a list of funding agencies who sponsor system of systems thinking? So bringing together experts at multiple scales. Our my issue is that funding is the biggest problem. Suggestions. Yeah, I think. Um, I think funding is a challenge for, for all of us, um, for sure. Uh, I have found, um, for my work, it's been really helpful to um, use my existing network to, to um, get into rooms where um, either leaders of other organizations who are working in that space are and can see the power of what we're doing um, and or there are funders in the room who see the power of what we're doing because it really usually only takes one or two good experiences for for the light bulb to start to go on um, and then to at least have a crack in the door so that you can um, start a conversation about um, the need for this kind of facilitated process. Um, there, I think I might need to know a little more about your specific area of research interest to be able to pinpoint funding agencies, but I would, I would look to the private foundations, I think, um, rather than the government uh, agencies. They tend, in my experience, to be more open to and more familiar with um, facilitated processes. Um, yeah. And there may be others on the phone who, ha uh, or on the call who have thoughts about that. Um, I would imagine that the public deliberation space might be a good place to look for funding for the kinds of things that, that you work on, Julie. Carrie, this has been really, really great um, and really good discussion. And I'm so happy to see so much participation. Um, I think if maybe we have time for one more question before we, unless Carrie, you have to go for a, a no, one o'clock. Okay, I can hang on for, for another question. Yeah. Okay. And I do, I, I love that people are, um, are putting um, ideas in the chat. Please keep it up. Yeah. Yeah, and um, um, Christine's question about saving the group chat info, I believe that there is a way. So I'm going to, I'm crossing all of my fingers and toes. I, I've seen it before. Um, once the video is finished recording, um, there's usually a, a, a separate file that has the, um, the chat. So I can, um, Put that into figure out a way to put that into the um, what gets posted to the interreach website. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, I'm also just noting down the resources that people. Excellent. Thank you. Suggested manually, <laughs> so we don't lose them. Yeah. Uh, All right. Any further questions? All right. Well, well thank Carrie, you. thank you so much. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. I look yeah. forward to staying connected with this group. Excellent. And thank you all for your work out there. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. All right.